Hey guys, and welcome back to a new clean architecture video. Yes, I will do another one. So those who actually saw my cryptocurrency app um, already saw one of my clean architecture videos. But because that video went through the roof, I decided to make another one. And if this video also gets that many views and also gets such a good watch time, then maybe I do even more. So it's fully up to you guys. Watch this video till the end, build this app, you will learn so much. And then, yeah, I will do even more if you like it and if it gets good views. So and how far will this video differ from the cryptocurrency app that, that I already made a tutorial about? Mm. So on the one hand, here I want to show you how you can build such an app with a local database. So the cryptocurrency app used a public API. This video will use a local room database. So those will just be some things that will be different here. And I also get some feedback for the last project, um, some smaller improvements that I could make. And these will also be things that I will be teaching you in this video. I'm also just someone who never stopped learning. None of my videos are perfect. So of course, I will teach you everything in the best way I know. But if there's something I can also um, improve on, of course, I will do that in the upcoming videos. And you also don't need to watch the other video before this one. Um, of course, it helps. But the other way around, it also helps if you watch this one first and then the other one. Um, so I will explain everything from scratch that um, regards clean architecture. So you should know stuff about MVVM, dependency injection, um, room databases. So those will be things that I um, that, that you should have heard of, that you should have used before, but everything around clean architecture will be explained from absolute scratch here. So let's actually dive into this app and see what we will build in the next hours. Mm, it will be a node app, as you can see, which has kind of a cool UI here. We will build everything, also the UI here in Jetpack Compose. So you can see I added some sample nodes each node has a different color. You can also assign these colors. Um, we can order these nodes here by extending this order menu with a nice little slide in animation. Right now they are ordered by date descendingly. So the newest node will appear on top here. If we say ascending, then uh, the oldest node is on top. We can say title ascending. So then it will order all these nodes by title alphabetically. Uh, we can say descending and yeah, you, you get it. Color doesn't really do anything here because we have one node of each color. But if we would have um, multiple nodes of the same color, these would be grouped together. So you could say, for example, for yourself, these orange nodes would be nodes regarding school. These, um, yeah, I don't know, red, reddish nodes um, are nodes for whatever, for shopping list. I don't know. <laughs> Feel free to be creative here. However, let's let's see how it works to create a node. We can click on this floating action button and then we will see the screen. We can choose one of these five colors. These also have a nice little animation here, little fade color animation. So let's choose this color, for example. We can choose a title, Hello YouTube. And we can enter some content. This is a sample note for demonstration. If we then click save, this node will be added here um, because right now we don't order by date descending. We can't see it, but you can see now when we do, we can see it. And here's our sample node. If we click on this node, we can edit it and update it. We can change the color, for example. If we click save, and you can see now it's a purple node. And we can also delete this node and then we will see a snack bar. We can undo this deletion so then it will be added again. And if we wait until the snack bar disappears, then the node will be fully gone. So that is what you're going to learn. That is a lot. That is great for your portfolio. That is great for your overall skill set that you actually need for every Android project out there. Um, these are widely used industry standards. So really make sure to watch this video till the end. I know it is a long video, but these are the videos you will actually benefit the most from. So let's first actually start by understanding 
why we should use clean architecture and what that actually is. So maybe you already know MVVM. Um, and now you might wonder what, what's the difference between MVVM and clean architecture? Isn't MVVM already kind of a clean architecture? Um, well, I know what you mean and I also for a long time thought MVVM means clean architecture. But clean architecture is actually a term that comes from Uncle Bob, so a very famous programmer, also wrote many great books. Um, and he actually came up with this approach of clean architecture. So that is an approach that is specific, um, what, that was specifically created by him. And it actually, it, it's more of an extension um, of existing architectures. So it makes use of sort of principles, it makes use of um, an existing architectural design pattern like MVM, for example, and comes with some new approaches like use cases, for example. Maybe you've heard of that, which we will use in this video and you will learn about that. So the whole purpose of clean architecture is that it makes your app scalable. Um, so usually if you work in the industry, you won't just work on such simple node apps or to-do apps. Instead, you will work on really large scale apps. And the, the larger an app gets, the more you actually need to think about how you structure it. Because a good architecture comes with several different aspects that it needs to fulfill. On the one hand, that is how easy is it to extend this architecture with new features, for example. Then we have how easy is it to test our functions in this architecture. So how easy is it to write test cases? Um, how easy or how understandable it is? So let's say a new team member joins your team. How, how long does this new team member need to actually understand what your project is about? And also one point that kind of goes along with the scalability is um, how well can you actually replace stuff? So let's say you use an HTTP library like Retrofit. Then what happens if you actually want to use a different one? So you decide, okay, now I don't want to use Retrofit anymore for our project. Instead, let, let's use the Kator client. Then a good architecture should make the switch very easy for you. So you should just have a very few files in which you actually need to change something to fully make this change from retrofit to the Kator client in your whole project, no matter how big your project is. So all these points come together here and will be fulfilled by this clean architecture aspect. One note right ahead. Um, usually, if you have a large scale app, you implement that app using multiple modules in Android. I won't do that here on YouTube. That is too complex for, for a single video. I also said that in the previous clean architecture video. But in this video, I will specifically focus on um, kind of emulating the, the module structure that I would typically use in a, in a real app, in a production app, in a big app, um, and kind of emulate this with our normal packages here in a single module. And that is already it for the theory here. Um, if you are actually interested in these topics like clean architecture, Android, Kotlin, um, which I guess you are if you're watching this video, then you will really like my newsletter, my email newsletter, which is fully free. You can uh, check the link down below and sign up for that and you will get regular Android Kotlin architecture advice right into your inbox. So to actually start, you need this initial project. This initial project contains all of the styles that I already set up. So uh, here, for example, the colors, the theme, so the primary color, background, all that stuff, and the dependencies. So this dagger hilt plugin, then these plugins up here, Kotlin Cap and Dagger Hilt, and these dependencies. So compose dependencies, curtains, Dagger Hilt, the room library for the database and the extension so we can use room with curtains. You want to make sure that you get this initial project down below. You will find a link to my GitHub repository. You can simply either download the zip file there or just clone the project in your Android Studio and then you can immediately start from there. The first thing I will do here is actually I will set up the package structure because I think that makes the most sense to actually understand why we structure it that way and which stuff we will actually put onto which places so you see how clean architecture actually works because it's all about the structure. Let's close these two tabs here, actually these two. Um, 
And let's see, we have a root package and in that root package we have UI and main activity. The UI package really only contains stuff relevant for a theme, so let's close that. Instead, what I will do is um, to show you this new package structure approach um, that I didn't show you in the last video. In the last video we just created a presentation, data and domain layer. So these are the three main layers that we have in clean architecture. The presentation layer contains the UI. So we present something to the user. I think that makes sense. The data layer contains everything relevant for data. So for example, API access, database access, shared preferences access, all that stuff would be put into the data layer. And the domain layer is kind of the, the connecting layer. So it contains our, our actual business rules. That means it contains business logic, for example, filtering a list. It contains definitions for repositories. We will get to that later. And it will actually contain our model classes. So our actual entities, for example. And in the last video, I actually set up the package structure like that, that we had data, um, domain and presentation as, as packages here in our root package. And that is fine for, for such a simple app, of course, um, and especially if you don't use multiple modules. But as soon as you use multiple modules, then you don't want to structure it that way. Because when you use a multi-module architecture, you actually want your modules to be um, kind of small, because the smaller they are, the, the faster they build and multiple modules will speed up your build time if you do it right, then they should also be replaceable. And if you just have three main modules, then these are not really replaceable. If they are smaller, then they are very well replaceable. So we kind of don't want this approach to have these um, main layers on our root level of our architecture, of our structure. Instead, what we, will build, uh, what we will do is we will divide our application by features. So what is a feature actually? A feature of an app is in the end just um, a set of one or multiple screens. So in, in this node up here, for example, we only have one single feature and that is everything regarding that node functionality. So displaying nodes, adding nodes, deleting nodes, all that belongs to a single feature. Um, if we, for example, wanted to extend this app and want to save these nodes on a backend server in, in the cloud, then we would need some kind of kind of authentication. So to log in, then this authentication would be one feature. So that would be the set of login screen, pa uh, register screen, forget password screen. Maybe then we have a profile page in which we can edit our profile. Then this edit profile screen and profile screen would be a feature. So the more of these things you have, the more features you have. So now the features actually make up your um, and the, the structure on, on, the, on the root level of your package structure. And then inside of each single feature, you have these different layers, presentation, domain, and data. So you actually divide the features by these layers and not your whole app by these layers. Um, I think that makes sense because that way it's actually a lot more replaceable. You have smaller modules and it's also a little bit clearer because someone only needs to take a look at your root structure of your app and sees, okay, profile feature, node feature, authentication feature. They immediately really know what your app is about and which packets, which package contains what. So let's actually dive into practice because I think then it gets a lot clearer what we, what I mean here. Um, so in our root package, we will now set up our whole package structure. Those will be a lot of packages, but I will explain as we do. So, as I said, we only have one single feature here in our app, which is the node feature. So we create a new package called feature node. The reason I call it feature underscore node is, well, it makes clear it's a feature. And also if you have more packages on your root level, then these feature packages will be grouped together because these will be sorted um, alphabetically. And because of that, all the feature packages will just be grouped together. That's just how <laughs> alphabetical sort works. And now in this specific feature module or package, we can divide this into our single layers. So presentation, data and domain. So let's start with the data package. So we can create a data package and we can directly also create another package in that for our data underscore source. 
So the data source will be the package in which we put everything regarding our room database because that is our data source. Maybe what's also important here is don't call this very um, library specific. So you don't want to call this this package data and this package like room and put every room specific stuff in the room package. No, you don't want to do that because it's just your data source. What if you actually want to replace your database with um, SQL delight, for example, then it would be called room. It shouldn't really know where the data comes from and it also shouldn't care about that. You just have a data source and that's all you need to know for your app. So apart from that, let's also create another package in the data package, which will be for the repository. That is already it for data. Let's create the domain package, which as I said, contains our business rules and business logic. So let's first create uh, the domain layer. And in that I will create a model package, which will contain our entities. We will create another package for use cases. Now let's just call it use case. What that is, I will get to that when we get to the point. Mm. We'll have another package for repository. We'll also get to that, what the difference between this and this is when we get to this. And we will have a util package in here. That's it for the domain layer. Let's then create our presentation layer in which we will create a package for every single screen we have. So we have two different screens in our app. On the one hand, we have the notes screen Let's just call it notes. And we will also have a screen called add edit note, because the screen will be reused if we add a new note or if we um, just edit an existing note. We'll also have a util package in the presentation layer, so we can create that. And also in both of these screen packages, we will have a package that contains the components specific for this single screen, so the composables in the end. And then we can take our main activity and drag it in the presentation layer, click refactor, then we're good to go. Mm. That's it for the feature packages. There are, there's actually one more package we need and that is for our dependency injection using Degrehild, so package for our modules. And I will put this in our root package new package called DI. And if you actually have multiple features, which you usually have if you use clean architecture, then I would also create something called a core or a commons package. Let's call it core here. That will just contain everything that is kind of shared. So let's say you have a UI component that you need throughout multiple screens in your in your app. So not only in one feature, then you would put this in the core package. So you would create a presentation package in here as well. And then you would have maybe components in here. And here you could put in uh, composables that you just need in your whole app. But because we only have one feature, this doesn't make really sense for, for our app here. So I will just delete it. And that is really everything about our project structure. Um, I hope this makes sense. I know some of these things aren't clear yet if you don't know clean architecture, um, like the differences between uh, like this repository, this repository, um, and what, what we put in these packages, what's the use case and stuff like that. But you will understand all of this when we actually implement it. So let's finally dive into implementation. And the first thing I want to do is implement our room database, so our data source. For that, we go in our data source package, surprise, surprise, and actually not. We will first go inside of our model package and create our node class. So just a class that represents one node that contains the relevant data for that. And that is in the end an entity. And we put entities in the domain package in the model package. So new Kotlin class of file called node will be a data class. Uh, yes, let me add that to git. And this will be an entity for room. So we annotate this with entity. So just a table in our room database in the end. And let's let's think about what do we need for each node. We first of all need a title. We need content, type string. We need a timestamp. So when we created that node, so we can actually order by date. 
We want to save a color for that node, which is here just an integer. And we need a primary key, so the ID of a node, which we need for every database. We annotate this with primary key called ID, and that's a nullable integer that's set to null initially. And actually a val. Like this. I will also create a companion object for that node because in here I just want to have a list, a hard coded list that contains the, the colors a node can possibly have. So val node colors is a list of, and here we can just put in our colors, that is red orange, comes from our colors file that you also already have, light green. And of course, you can choose your own colors here. Um, I, will, I just like these ones. Um, let's choose violet, um, baby blue, and we have red, pink. Cool. So with this list, we can just control which colors we will actually, um, we are able to choose for our node. And this will also then decide about the the, the, the color bubbles with which we can actually change the colors for each node. So far so good. Let's go into our data source package next and create our node DAO. So a DAO is a data access object in which we just define the functions with which we want to access the data in our room database. So we want to have functions to insert nodes, delete nodes, to get a single node and just to get all nodes. So let's right click new Kotlin class of file node DAO select interface, annotate this with add DAO, and let's define the functions in here. First of all, we will have a function to get all nodes, which will return a flow, so Kotlin Curtains flow here, of list of node. So this will just return all nodes of our database. For that, we need to Annotate this with add query because we now need an SQL query that actually retrieves all these nodes from our database. And that's a super simple query. We can just say select everything, so an asterisk from our node table. And then Room will do the rest for us and generate the actual implementation for that behind the scenes. Then we also want to have a function that gives us a node by its ID. So when we click on a node to update it, we need to load the, the specific node with that ID in our add edit node screen. So we need a function for that. And that will be a suspend function get node by ID. ID will be of type integer here. And this gives us a nullable node. So in case it doesn't exist, it will be null. And we can also attach a query here, which will be select um, everything from node where ID is equal to the ID we pass. So we do this with such a colon. And this is a suspend function here, like all other functions in this file, except for this one, because here we just directly return the node. We don't wrap this around a flow object or something like that. I know that's a very common question why this one isn't suspend and this one is. Yeah, because this one returns a flow, then we, we can do that. Then we need two more functions here on the one hand to insert a node. So we can say insert and we want to pass some parameters here. And that is a on conflict strategy. We set it to replace. So that means if we call this insert function with an ID that already exists in our database, then it will just update the existing entry. So we don't need an additional function to update a node. Instead, we can just insert a node with the same ID and it will update the one that was already saved. So suspend function uh, insert node. We pass a node here. That's already it. And we will have a function to delete a node. Suspend function, delete node, pass the node, and that's it. That's already it for our DAO. Um, the next step is to create a class for our database, also in our data source package, called node database. Node database will be an abstract class. We annotate it with a database. And here we need two arguments on the one hand entities. So we just define the tables we have in our database. That is just one here, which is node um, from our domain package, no double column class. And we want to define the version and just set it to one. 
the node database will inherit from room database and we will have an abstract val for our node DAO here of type node DAO. And that's already it. Room will do the rest for us. So now we have our database. What's the next step? The next step is to actually make use of the database and call the actual functions of our DAO in our repository. Because what is the job of the repository? The repository directly accesses our data sources, so either database or API. Usually there can be multiple other ones, but usually you have an API or a database and the repository directly accesses these. The job of the repository is then to, to take these data sources, multiple data sources usually, and determine which one to actually forward to corresponding use cases. So for example, if you get data from an API and you also have a caching layer and mechanism in your app, then the repository needs to decide, okay, do I, know, do I now load the data from the cache or do I now load the data from the API? So this decision logic and also checking if there were any errors in that API request or in reading from the database and then just forwarding this data to the use cases. The use cases shouldn't know where the repository gets the data from. They just want to get the data. That's all uses, use cases care about. So let's go ahead and do that. In our repository package of the domain package, we will create an interface for the repository called node repository. The reason that's an interface is that's just good for testing because then we can easily create fake versions of this repository. Um, for, for test cases, we often just like to have fakes because we don't want to use our real API and our real database to run the test cases on. No, the test cases should be quick. So we want to have our own fake version of a repository that just simulates the same behavior as a repository. So we can pass that fake repository to our use cases in that case. So the use cases know what to use and the use cases then again don't care where the data comes from. They don't care if it comes from an API or just from a local list that was implemented in a fake repository. They just get the data and do something with it. So in here we just have one function for each function we have in our DAO. On the one hand we have function get nodes, uh, which returns that flow of type list of node. Then we have a suspend function, get node by ID. We pass the ID and get the node. We have a suspend function insert node, where we pass the node as a parameter to be inserted into our database. And we have a suspend function delete node, where we can pass a node to delete from our database. That's it for the, uh, the definition of the repository. These definitions not only for repositories, also for other classes. If you have these definitions in form of an interface, these belong in the domain layer. Now the implementations of that, so where we actually say, okay, these nodes come from a database. Um, this insertion should happen in a database. That happens in the data layer. So in this repository package, we right click new Kotlin class, node repository, implementation we call it which will implement this uh, not main repository not repository interface and this will actually now take a parameter here in the constructor and that will be our actual DAO object so our node DAO then we can press ctrl I in here ctrl A to select everything and enter to implement these functions First of all, the get nodes function. Here we just return DAO dot get nodes. So because that's a very simple app and we only have a database, there won't be much logic in this repository. We just call the functions from our DAO. But as soon as you also have an API in here, then things get more complex and you actually have some data logic in here. Then for get node by ID, we just return DAO and get node by ID and pass the ID. Insert node. Here we can say DAO dot insert node. And finally, down at the lead node. And that's already it for this repository implementation. So far, so good. Those are our repositories, or rather our single repository. 
the next step and the next layer we will implement is a use case. So actually multiple use cases, but we'll start with a single one. The use case is contained in our business logic. So what we previously with plain MVVM did in the view model is now done in the use cases. The advantage of use cases is that on the one hand they make our code very readable because a use case is in the end just a single thing our app does, a single user action. For example, getting nodes. For example, adding a new node. For example, deleting a node. So I think you get it. Just a single thing a user can do in our app. It doesn't need to be linked to, to um, a database function or an API call. Often it is, but it doesn't need to be. It could also be something like uh, searching in a local list or so. And these use cases are named exactly as what they do. So for example, add node use case. And you don't need to have like uh, 20 years of development experience to understand what is actually inside of that class if you just see the name. And that's one big advantage of use cases. They, they quickly reveal what they actually contain by just looking at the class name. And the other good thing about those is that they, they make your code very reusable. Or they, the use cases are very reusable because in the end our view models will call the use cases. And if you would implement every API call and the validation and business logic um, related to that in a view model, then as, as soon as you need that in a different view model, the same logic, you have duplicate code. If you instead put that in a single use case class, then you can reuse the use case class between different view models and you don't have that duplicate code. So that makes your code just a lot more clean. Let's start with the first use case that we will have in our app and that will also be the most complex one, which is the get notes use case. It will be the most complex one because when we get nodes, we actually want to have the option to order nodes. So we want to be able to sort by title, by uh, color and by date, both ascending and descending. So we have six different ways of sorting uh, a list of nodes and that's business logic. That belongs in the use case, for example. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to use cases, use case package, create a new Kotlin class or file. And this will be the get nodes use case. That's how I called it in the previous video. That's totally fine to, to call your use cases like that. Some people said, hey, you don't need to call them with a use case here. You can also just call them get nodes. It's true, you can do both. Um, just to do something different here from the last video, I'll call this get nodes, but you're also totally fine calling your use cases with use case afterwards because then it's even clearer that this is a use case class, but this is also kind of clear. So I will call this get notes, but you're right doing both ways. And this will now get a reference to our repository, our node repository. And here make sure that you actually make this of the interface type and not of the implementation type, because otherwise it's not replaceable. And that's the whole purpose of using an interface. And now every use case out there needs to have one function that kind of executes that use case. So use cases only should only have one single function that is public and can be called from the outside. They can have private functions, multiple ones, if you just want to have utility functions to, to make your code more readable, uh, but they should only have one public function. And some people call it execute. I just don't call it um, in any way. I just make it an operator invoke function. So we can call this use case like a function. So operator function invoke that will override the invoke operator. So we can call our class like a function in the end. You will see how this works. And this will return a flow of a list of nodes. And in here, we just put in our business logic to in this case, get our nodes, but we also want to sort our nodes. So whoever calls this use case, whichever view model that is, should be able to somehow tell this use case, hey, this is the way of ordering I want. Please give me the list of nodes. So we need to pass a parameter here to actually decide about this, this type of ordering. And for that, we will create two utility classes that make this on one hand readable and on the other hand just 
um, yeah, very clean. So let's do that in our util package here for the domain layer. Right click new Kotlin class or file. And those will both be sealed classes. On the one hand, I will call this order type. So the order type will either be ascending or descending. We can create objects in here. Object ascending of type order type. Or we have a descending. So with that order type, we can just distinguish, okay, do we now want to sort ascending or descending? And we can create another class in here called node order. So this will now tell us, okay, do we actually order by title, by color, by date? And then also, do we order ascending or descending by these, by these types? So also sealed class, and this will contain a class title. So we could set this down to node order dot title. So we order by title. Um, here we can pass our order type. And that will just be of type node order. And here we actually also want to pass the order type in the constructor of node order because every node order type um, needs such an order type. So if it's ascending or descending, so we can say val order type of type order type. Let's duplicate that twice. Call this date and call this color. So we have three different ways of ordering a list of nodes. And what we can now do is we can go to our get nodes use case and we can pass this node order. So node order, node order of type node order. I will move this in a new line. And we can set the default to node order dot date. And now we can say, okay, we want to uh, order by a date descending by default. So that is how we can now distinguish between different order types. So what do we now return here? So we need to return a flow of a list of nodes. That's exactly what we get from our repository. So we can say return repository get nodes and I mean, right now there are no errors, but of course that's not enough because we haven't applied our node order yet. So what we want to say is, we want to say map. So we want to map the result list. So whatever list we get from our repository, we map this to a new list. So we can give this a name of nodes. And now, depending on which order type that is, we want to map this to the right list, so to the right sorted list in the end. So we can say when our node order that order type is ascending we do this and if that is descending we do this if it's ascending we can have another one expression when the node order this term is title um, actually we don't even need these blocks of code we can just duplicate this and have date and we can have color. So when the node order is title, then we want to map this nodes list to a nodes list that is ordered by title. So we can say nodes sorted by. So the sorted by function will sort uh, will sort ascending and the sorted by descending function will well sort descending so here we use sorted by and now we can say it dot title so we will simply sort by title and actually let's also say dot title at lowercase otherwise all the lowercase letters will come before the uppercase letters we don't really want to care about that so we map everything to lowercase if we want to order by date we say notes sorted by it dot timestamp and by color we say note Notes that sorted by it that color. And then we can simply copy this, paste it here. And here we just need to swap out this sorted by with sorted by descending. Here, here, and here. And well, that's our use case. That's business logic. And it contains how it actually accesses our repository. That's a very, very typical use case. Um, yeah. And now this can be reused in our whole app. So if you have maybe multiple screens in which you need to access a list of nodes with a given order, then you can just reuse this use case class. So you don't need to put this logic here 
in all of your view models that kind of need to to have this business logic. And the other use cases here in our app will be a lot simpler. So the next step here would be to think about which other use cases we actually need in our first screen in the in the uh, notes screen where we just just show the list of notes. Well, of course, now we have the the major use case for that to just get that list of nodes and filter or rather order it. Um, but we need one more um, and that is actually deleting a node. So let's quickly create that one. That will be super simple. Let's go to our use case package, create a new Kotlin class called delete node use case or just delete node here to stay consistent. And that will take our repository in the constructor our node repository and it will have a suspend operate suspend operator function invoke it will take the node that we want to delete and it will just call the repository with delete node and that's already our use case it's very simple so now these are actually the two use cases we need for our nodes view model um but i actually want to do one thing here so we actually will have two more use cases in our app here, which is for adding a node and for getting a single node, so by its ID. And if this, if your app actually grows, then of course it will have more and more use cases. And if you want to pass all these in your view models, then that can quickly become quite a big view model constructor. So what I actually want to do is I want to wrap the use cases for a single feature into one class so we just need to inject that single class that contains all of our use cases for that feature um, into our view model constructor and that just makes it much cleaner so let's see how this works we just go to use cases create a new kotlin class called nodes or just node use cases because those are the use cases for our node feature we select data class and in here, we will just have a variable for every single use case we have. On the one hand, that is our get nodes use case, and that is our delete node use case. And later, we can then extend this delete node. And this will be the class that we will inject into our view model. So let's actually do that next. Let's set up our dependency injection library dagger hilt, which is very easy. We just need to create an application class in our root package node app select class which is an application we annotate it with hilt android app and that's already it for this class we need to register this application class in our manifest let's open this go in here say name node app and then the last thing we need to do to be able to inject dependencies is to provide these in a so-called module so in the module we just put in all the dependencies we want to provide with a given lifetime of these dependencies. So in our case, we will just have singletons. So in our DI package, right click new Kotlin class. That will be an object called app module. If you have many features, um, then I would usually just have one module per feature. And yeah, it's, it's actually up to you if you put all of that in, in that DI folder here in your root folder. Um, I think it's also okay if you actually create DI folders in each feature. Um, I like to have these in one uh, in, on, in one package here, but that's fully up to you. In a multi-module project, you would also have these dependencies in your app level module. So let's click enter here, have the module annotation and install in. We wanna install it in the singleton component and well, what do we provide here? First of all, let's provide an instance of our room database. So provides at singleton function provide node database. This will require our application context to create that. So we can simply pass the application here. Dagger Hilt will automatically um, insert that and it will return a node database. We can then simply return room dot database builder. Here we need to pass the context, so our application, 
the class of our database we want to create, which is node database double colon class of Java, and the database name, which we can create in here in the node database class, just in the companion object, const val database underscore name, and that will be nodes db. Switch back has a node database dot database name. Then we can call a dot build. And this function is already finished. Then next we actually want to have a function that provides our repository. So the node repository. So add provides singleton function provide node repository. And what do we need to create our node repository? We need our DAO. And because we don't provide the DAO itself, instead just the database, which I would recommend doing, we instead want to use the database instance here of type node database, because using that we can uh, retrieve the corresponding DAO. That will uh, return a node repository. And here we just return the implementation of that. So node repository implementation passing our db dot node DAO. Another cool thing about dependency injection is, well, let's say you now want to test your your class or your use cases, for example, um, then this function provides just a node repository. So the interface, um, specifically our implementation here, because that's of course what we want to use for our um, production app in the end. So we only use the node repository that accesses our room database. But as I already said, in the test cases, we usually want to have a fake version of that. So all we really need to change for test cases is to have a separate module that instead of providing uh, this uh, node repository implementation just provides a fake node repository which is also which also implements this interface so that's really the only the only change we need to do and then this dependency injection will take care of everything else. We don't need to change anything in the use cases, in the repositories, in uh, our view models, nowhere, only in this module. And finally, one last thing we only need to provide here, and that is our node use cases. So function uh, provide node use cases, just that wrapper class we just created, and that will now need our repository instance and returns node use cases. For get nodes, it will return um, a get nodes use case passing the repository. And for delete node, it will pass we will pass a delete node use case with our repository. And that's it. Now we can inject that in our view models and actually access these two use cases. So let's do that next. Let's create our nodes view model. We want to go down to nodes. Um, right click and create a view model class. So the view model classes are directly coupled to our actual UI. Um, so if you know MVP design pattern, for example, then the view model would basically be the presenter. The, the job of the view model in clean architecture is not um, business logic as it was in plain MVVM. Instead, the job now is to actually make use of the use cases. The use cases contain the business logic and the view model now needs to um, take the result of these use cases. So, for example, our our ordered list that our ordered list of nodes that we get from the database, and it kind of needs to put all of that in a in a state that will represent or that is relevant for our UI. So the UI can observe on that state and just yeah have can easily display that in a readable way. That's the job of the view model. So I'll call this class nodes view model. Select file, and I will use my live template here, hill view model. You need to tap this from hand, probably if you don't have this. And I will call this nodes view model. It will now take our node use cases here in the constructor, which is the wrapper class we created. And with this wrapper class, we can access all the use cases we have for our nodes feature. So now the next step is we actually want to have um, one state object, one state wrapper class that represents the current UI state of the node screen. So let's now think about which kind of states, which kind of variables we're interested in um, that are relevant for 
um, yeah, just showing the UI as we want to show it. On the one hand, we of course need to show the current radio button selection, so just the current node order. So we need the current node order in that state. Then we of course want to show a list of nodes, so we need to save the list of nodes that we loaded from the database. And we want to have a state that actually decides if this order section is visible or not. So remember, we could easily collapse and expand this. So those are actually the three things we want to have in a state object. And for that, I will go into our nodes package, create a new data class called nodes state. And it will contain just that. First of all, our list of nodes. So list of node from our domain package. And that will just be an empty list by default. Then we will have our node order that will decide about the radio buttons, which is by default ordered by date descending. So node order dot date descending. And what is left is actually val is order section visible. So that's a boolean, which is initially false. So initially we don't show that section. So now that we have the state that we kind of keep in our view model and save there, so it also survives screen rotations, there's one more thing I always think of when I'm implementing a view model with clean architecture. And that is um, thinking about every single UI action there could possibly be from the user. It's basically everything the user could possibly do in our node screen. For example, changing the order. So the user could click any of these radio buttons to change the order. Then what else could it be? It could be the user clicks on deleting a node. So then we also want to fire off an event to the view model, which will call the corresponding use case. What else could it be? It could be that the user actually clicks on this toggle, toggle order selection icon, which will just hide or show the order selection. That's also something the user can do. That's a user action that comes from the UI. And one last action that might not be so obvious is that we actually can also restore nodes. So when we deleted a node, we will show a snack bar and that snack bar will have an undo button. If we click undo, we will insert that node into our database again. And that also is a user action. And for these, these different actions or events, I will actually always create a wrapper class, a sealed class that contains these, so we can very easily send these events from our composables to our view model and then just have one expression in the view model and depending on what kind of event that is, we just do the corresponding action. So let's see how this works. We just want to go to our nodes package, create a new class, sealed class as I said, and that will be called nodes event. Select enter here and in here we will just have these four events I actually talked about. On the one hand, that is a data class to order the nodes, so the order event that will take the new node order as a val actually here, and that is a nodes event. So then we can just send this order event from our um, UI to the view model when we click, uh, click on another radio button. And yeah, the view model will then call the use case with that specific node order. Then another event we actually have here is to delete a node. Here we need to pass the node we want to delete. Type nodes event. Then we will have an object to actually restore a node. So when we click undo, then we just want to re restore the most recently deleted node. Um, that will be a nodes event and one more and that is actually that we can toggle the order section so the visibility of that and now we can take the sealed class go to our nodes view model and create a function on event so this is the function we will trigger from our UI here we pass the corresponding event of type nodes event and now we can very easily check when that event is an order event, we can do this. When that event is delete note from notes event actually, if it is restore note and if it is toggle order section. 
And now the job of the view model is to either call some use cases from that. Um, usually we do this, but not always. For example, for this toggle order section, all we really do is we take our node state and we just toggle this boolean and update the state's value. So it's not always linked to a use case here. So let's take this simple example and see how this works. We just can uh, create a state variable here. I also have a left template for that. You need to tap this by hand again. I will call this state. Will be of type nodes state. And will be initialized with an empty node state by default. Then we can remove this. And this will be the state that contains the values our UI will observe. Now, we can go to this toggle order section here and we can say underscore state that value and we update this with state that value that copy so we take the same value so we copy it but now we have the option to change some values of that copy and we want to change is order section visible we just want to toggle it so state that value is order section visible and that just toggled let's go on with deleting and restoring a node because that's also quite easy. We want to go in here to the little node. We want to launch a coroutine and view model scope. And here we just call our delete node use case. So node use cases dot delete node. And now because that's an operator function, we overrided the invoke operator. We can call this like a function here, even though that, that's actually a class. Um, so for the node the, that we want to delete, we just pass the node we pass to the event. And for restoring a node, we have two options. We can either just um, get an instance to the deleted node in our UI and directly insert it afterwards with a, like an add node use case. And I kind of like the way I do here more to call it restore node because it tells you exactly what it does. And for that, I actually just want to keep a reference here in the view model to the last deleted node. So just private var um, recently deleted node is just a node, a nullable one set to null initially. And just when we delete a node here in our delete node event, we say recently deleted node is equal to event.node. So we just save the reference of that in that object. In a restore node, we actually can't do that yet because we don't have our add node use case. Um, and we actually want to add this node back to our database. Um, so what we would need is we would actually need to create this. So let's do that. Let's go to use cases and create another use case called add node, which will take a reference to a repository again, a suspend operator function invoke, and it gets the node we want to insert. Now, you might think we can just do this repository uh, insert node, pass the node, but no, we actually only want to insert a node if we successfully validated the um, its values before, so the title and the content. If there is an issue with that, for example, if the title is empty, we don't want to insert it. And checking if it is actually empty is business logic, doesn't belong in the view model, instead it belongs in this use case. So we can just go ahead and see if the node dot title is blank. Well, we want to do something here. We want to tell the view model, hey, the title is blank. Um, I actually didn't insert the node here. And there are different ways how we can do this. We could make this function return something like an, um, a node validation error class or so, so that we just return a specific error. But what I also like is just creating an, an exception class for that and throwing that here. So let's go to our node class. And down here, we can just create an invalid node exception, which will take the message and just inherit from exception passing this message. Then uh, we can go back to add a node. We can say this function throws this invalid node exception just for the documentation that is actually. Mm. And in here, if that's blank, we can say throw invalid node exception. And we can say 
the title of the node can't be empty. And we can do the same for node.content. That's blank. Of course, you could validate more if it's a, like a minimum, maximum length. Um, but I'll leave it simple here, just that you get how you, you would do it. Mm, invalid node exception. And actually just the same. Just with the content. And if these two if statements were false, we'll actually just insert the node. And our view model can yeah, just check in a try and catch block if an accept exception was thrown or not. So in here in a restore node, we actually don't need to do this because this will only be called when we click on undo. And that means the node was already successfully inserted. So we don't need to check this again, but we need to check this uh, if there was an exception when we actually add a new node. So right here, it's totally fine to do node use cases. Um, or oh, we don't have an add use case yet. Let's go to our node use cases, say val add node, and that's an add node use case. Then our app module, say add node is an add node use case with our repository. Then here we can call this add node passing event dot, actually not event dot node, we just want to add our recently deleted node and if that's null we just return at launch which shouldn't actually happen. And we could also just to be sure set recently deleted node to null afterwards so even if we would call this multiple times afterwards from the UI for whatever reason then we wouldn't insert the the same node over and over again instead we can only insert it once and then we will kind of invalidate it and now there's one event missing here which is the order event which will just retrieve the list of nodes with our given order the first thing we want to check here is if the order actually changed so when we click on the same radio button that is already checked we just don't want to do anything. So we want to say if state dot value dot node order double colon class. If that's actually the same as event dot node order double colon class, the state value node order dot node order dot order type is equal to event dot node order dot order type then we just want to return. So let's go through this, what I actually mean and what this does. We just check if the the order type, the, uh, the node order is actually the same as the node order we wanted to change it to and also the order type, so ascending or descending is the same as this is already um, in our state, then we just don't want to do anything. The reason why we compare the class here and we don't do uh, this um, is that doing this would just compare the uh, would just check for referential equality so if we deal with the same reference here which would never happen because the reference in our state is a different one than this because this was just created to change the order um, because we don't deal with data classes here in our um, where is it node order all these are just normal classes um, which don't override the equal function. So to compare two classes, we could override that here, but we can also just check the class uh, or compare the class here. If those were data classes, that would work, but then we couldn't pass the order type here or we, we would need to rename it because those would need to be vals. We would have a no name conflict. So all I'm saying is we, we just want to check if the class is actually the same. So if the, the class of the first order type, so title for example, is the same as the class of the second order type. That's all we're doing here. And if that's the same and also the order type is the same, here we can do that because it's just an object, it's not a normal class, then we just return. If we didn't return, we just want to call a function that just gets nodes with the given node order. So let's create that function down here. Gets node get notes with node order and well what will this do? It will first of all just take 
our node use cases that get nodes pass in that node order that will now return a flow that comes from our database the database or room will rather um, trigger this flow and emit something new whenever something changes in our database but we kind of want to map this to our compose state so we can say that on each on each emission on each emission which will each be a list of nodes we want to say state that value is state that value that copy where we set the nodes list to the new nodes list we also want to update the node order so node order will be the node order we passed here and then we also don't for, uh, shouldn't forget to to launch this flow so launch in our view model scope coroutine well this this seems correct it's actually not a hundred percent correct because every time we call this get notes function we will actually get a new flow a new instance of that flow because we call that function every single time so what we actually want to do is whenever we recall this function we want to cancel the old coroutine that is already observing our database that's not so difficult we can just keep track of the job here private var get notes job for example is a nullable job and null by default and just before we get this um, before we just get a new flow a new coroutine job we can say get new job uh, get notes job that cancel and then we assign the new job to get notes job and then we can also scroll up um, and just call this function in uh, init again uh, as well because we also just want to initially load some nodes with a default order so that would just be node order dot a date and we want to order that descending uh, descending like that and that's already it for our nodes view model so the next step now is implementing our nodes screen so the screen where we display the list of nodes for that we will need some composables on the one hand we need a radio button that just allows us to place some text next to a radio button we need the order section that contains all of our i think five radio buttons to order the list and we need the note composable so if we just take a look here this this note composable this will be a little bit tricky here with this little clip um yeah you'll see how i solve this but that's basically what we will do next so first such a radio button, then this whole section here, then such a node item, and then the whole screen. So, in our notes folder, components. We're going to create a new cotton file called the default radio button. And in here we will create a composable, it's a little bit laggy right now. Composable default radio button. And that needs some parameters. On the one hand, it needs the text that is placed next to it. It needs a boolean, whether it's checked or not. It needs a function on check, which is triggered when we actually check this button. It needs the modifier, for which we can pass the default one. And that's already it for the parameters. All this will really contain is just a row and then a normal radio button in that row, a spacer and a text. So let's do that. Just normal row and we will say the modifier is just the modifier we passed. And we set the vertical alignment to center, center vertically. Then in here we will have the radio button. We can pass um, selected, is it uh, checked? Let's rename this to um, select it just to stay consistent and also this on check function to on select. Then on click will just be equal to on select. And for the colors of that radio button, we will choose radio button defaults. 
that colors and for some weird reason it always does that. We only want colors. The selected color will be material I actually selected color. Material theme colors primary which is white here in my in my case. Um and the unselected color material theme colors and that will be on background. Then as I said we'll have some space here, so spacer with width of 8 dp and then just some text at this place, the text we passed. So text and we can set the style of the text to material theme topography body 1. And that is it for the default radio button. Next create the auto section I talked about with our five radio buttons. In the components package we create a new file auto section create a composable in here called order section. We want to pass a modifier here. We want to pass the node order so that will decide which radio buttons are actually checked and that will by default be node order date and that descending. Um, Actually, not like this. That is enough. And when the order changes on order change, we pass the new node order as a callback function to the parent composable. And now for this order section, we will just have a column of two rows. So the first row will contain these three radio buttons and the second row will contain these two. So now let's simply do that. Column. Here we pass our modifier for the modifier and then in here as I said we will have two rows on the one hand a row where we pass modifier fill max width and in here we can then put our default radio buttons. The text here will just be title and I won't use any string resources here usually in a production app I would do that but I just want to keep at least this thing rather simple for this tutorial. So I'll just hardcode strings here. Selected will be oh, let's let's actually rearrange this. This radio button should be selected if our node order is actually node order dot title because then we want to order by title and this radio button should be selected. On select here we say on order change. So when we click on this title radio button, we want to trigger our callback function with the new node order, which is node order dot title and we will keep the current order type so node order dot order type then let's have some space here spacer with the width of 8 dp import dp and then we can just copy this actually now let's just copy this button paste it here and paste it again copy the spacer and paste it so for the second radio button that will be by date so we replace this with date and this with date and this will be by color like this and that's already it for our first row and then we can have another spacer below our row so we have some vertical space um, height of 16 dp and then we have our second row where we can also set the modifier to fill max width. Then we can scroll up and copy these first two radio buttons, paste them in here. This will be for ascending sort. Here this is selected when the node order dot order type is actually ascending. And when we select this, uh, this is a little bit more complicated than it actually looks like because um, we actually want to keep the current node order but we want to change the node order type and we don't want to make this node order uh, this order type here mutable that's not a good practice so what I will actually do is to be able to just change this I will um, hold control click on node order to open this and I will actually create a copy function for node order 
If these would be data classes here, we would have such a copy function so we could easily change the order type. But this doesn't work because those are not data classes and if we would make these data classes as you can see, then we would need to make this a val and if we make this a val, then we have a name conflict here. So that sadly doesn't work. Or, or if we rename this order type, which I don't want. Um, so what I will do is I will just have a function here called copy and this will just um, allow us to pass the new order type. So we will keep the node order, but we change the order type and then return the new node order. And this just returns when this, so when the current node order is a title, then we return a title node order with our order type that we passed. And then we can duplicate that twice do the same for date and color. And now we can go back to order section and actually make use of that by saying node order dot copy. And here we want to change the order type to ascending. Then let's just copy this and paste it for this radio button. This one is descending change this to descending and this to descending. And that's already it for our order section. So next up we have our node item. So let's create that in our components package in the node package called node item, select file, create a composable node item. And this will take quite some parameters, which on the one hand will be the node that we want to display. It will be a modifier. It's equal to the default modifier. Then we have the corner radius, which is just a dp amount here. And I'll default it to 10 dp. So that will just be yeah, the, the, the corner radius here um, of our nodes here on the, the edges. Then we will have a cut corner radius or rather cut corner size, let's call it like that, that will be 30 dp. And what that actually is, is this size of, of this corner that, that is cut off here. So this from, from here to here is 30 dp. So we can also pass that from the outside. And when we actually click on the delete icon, we want to trigger a callback function. So how will we actually do this? Because this is something that I think is not possible with a simple modifier to um, achieve that, that we cut off this uh, the single corner. Um, I mean, we can cut off corners, um, but I don't think with normal modifiers it's possible to do that just for one corner. And then also, how do we actually draw this, this little um, corner that is cut off here? And well, this is a very good use for canvas. So we are going to use a canvas here. We are going to draw a round rectangle here. So just four corners with round um, corners. <laughs> and for this corner, we will actually um, apply a clip. So if you watch my canvas course, which I can only recommend you to do, um, then you know what a clip is. So we basically just draw a path around this rectangle here. But at this point, we cut off this edge and everything outside of this path, this round corner here that would normally be there, will be cut off and will not be drawn. And then we will also draw another round rectangle here where half of it will also be cut off, but the other half will display here. So let's just jump into it and then everything will become clear. Let's first create a box because we will need to draw something on top of our canvas and for that a box makes a sense. Here we just apply the modifier and then in here, as I said, we will have a canvas. For the canvas modifier, we need to pass modifier match parent size. And now you might wonder what's the difference between match parent size and fill max size. That's a small but a very important difference for this case, because if we use fill max size, it won't work. The thing with canvases is that they need a fixed size. So 
they actually need a size that they know when when they are actually initialized here, instantiated or called. Um, it's actually a function, yeah, when they are called. So we could do something like we set the width to 300 dp, the height to 200 dp, then that would work. Then we just define the space or the area for our canvas to draw on. But because we live in a world where we actually want to support multiple screen sizes, we can hard code our sizes. So we kind of need a relative size unit that still gives our canvas the size it, it needs. The thing with match parent size is, this will actually give our canvas the size after the parent has measured its constraints. So after this box knows how much um, width and how much height it occupies, then this will return the size to the canvas. If we use fill max size, however, uh, max size, then this will affect the size of the parent box. Because if the parent box, let's say, that one does not have a modifier with a size, then this will actually also stretch the whole size of, of the parent box. So that's not what we want. We actually want to check how much space does the box occupy, and the box knows that after the texts actually um, took their space. And then we will take the space for the canvas as well. I hope that makes sense. So in here we have our draw scope. We can draw things on. And as I said, if you really want to learn more about canvas and not, not just such a simple thing, then, then really do me the favor and just check out um, the, the course down below. Um, you can just see what I do there, and what you especially learn there, uh, much more advanced things, much more customized UI. So that will definitely be a course you will benefit from long term, and especially your UI will be um, will will thank you for that. <laughs> Other than that, let's jump into it. So as I said, we want to have this clip path. So we want to define a path that goes around this rectangle, but at this corner it's actually cut off. And we can easily do that by using val well, clip path, set this to new path that apply, and we first draw a line to size dot width minus cut corner size dot two pixels. So that is the x coordinate and zero f the y coordinate. So right now we just start at zero zero. We draw a line to our size dot width, which would be here, but we subtract our cut corner size, so we are actually here. And now we draw a line down here, then down here, here, and then we close it. So, next line, a line two, actually size that width here, and cut corner size two pixels. Then a line two, size that width, size that height. So size is just the size of our canvas here, in case you didn't know. Mm, then line two. 0f size.height and then we can just say close to close our path and then we can say that we want to clip a path where we pass our clip path and then in here everything we put in here and draw in there um, will just be it will just make sure that the content is inside of our path so everything we draw outside of the path will just be cut off like this corner here for example so first of all, let's draw the big round rectangle, draw a round rect, the color will just be the color of our node, we need to convert that to compose color, uh, node.color, the size will be the size of our canvas, and the corner radius of that round rectangle will be corner radius, um, corner radius, not too pixels I think yeah it needs that in pixels then let's copy this and draw one more round rectangle actually for this little one here where the half of it is actually cut off here well what is the color that's just a little bit darker color so what we actually want to do is we want to take this color and do some kind of blending operation that just makes it a bit darker so we can say this color is color color utils blend argb here we can define two colors so the first color will be blended which is our node color and the second color is the color we blend it with so we can say 
um, color dot black. And here we actually need to choose the the Android graphics color. We can also just pass 0x zero 0000. Um, zero, 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 zero. That is just equivalent to black. And now we define a ratio, so how much you want to blend it with. Let's just set it to 20%. And we still get an error. Oh, because I already wrapped this around a color object. So with that, it actually works. Here we also want to define a top left. So the top left corner of that, because it's not zero. If it's zero, we can leave it away, like for this rectangle. Here it's not. Instead, we can define an offset here, which is sized at width minus our cut corner size to two pixels. And I will just move this to minus 100 on the y-axis. Um, just that we don't get some roundings here. Um, that would be very slightly visible. But I just want to move this corner a little bit up here because we don't see it anyways. Then we don't have the rounding of this edge here, of this corner. And the size of that will be a size. Cut corner size to two pixels plus 100 now and the height will be the same actually because it's a square also plus 100 f and that's it for the canvas so i hope that somehow made sense if not then just ask in the comments or even better get my canvas course because there i can go much deeper in this stuff mm. so now below this this canvas we want to actually have the two texts and our uh, icon button for deleting the note. So let's have a column here for the text. Set the modifier to fill max size. Then we will have some padding of 16 dp. And I'll apply some more padding just to the end this time of 32 dp. Um, I do this because then we actually make sure that the text doesn't overlap this this icon button which takes some arguments the text is not the title then the style is material theme um, typography h6 then we want to change the color of that to material theme colors on surface we want to change the max lines to one. So we just have one line for um, the, the title. And we want to set the overflow to ellipses. So that it just gets cut off when it gets too long. Then let's have some space with a height of 8 dp. And let's have another text. Let's copy this one, which will be for our note content. We can say a body one here for this for the text style. We can set the max lines to let's say 10. So we have, um, we show 10 lines at, at max here. And if it gets longer, you can see it gets cut off. And we can click on it to see the rest. And then after this column, we're going to have our icon button. So icon button, I actually have a live template for that icon button. Mm, the image vector will be icons default delete content description delete note on click we just set that to our on delete click function and we apply a modifier that we align this at the bottom end so modifier align bottom end and that's it for this note item a little bit bigger now um, yeah so the next step is actually our notes screen so we just put everything together there so let's do that in our notes package new kotlin class of file called notes screen composable notes screen and that takes some parameters on the one hand our nav controller which we don't have yet and on the other hand our view model instance so notes view model equal to hill view model then in here, let's have a reference to our state we can get from our view model. We actually want to have a scaffold state because we are going to have a, a scaffold here to show snack bars. Remember, scaffold state. We need a curtain scope in here. Um, remember, curtain scope. That will actually be needed to show the snack bar. 
Um, and that's it for the variables, I think. So let's create our scaffold first. It will take a floating action button. So we can create that in here. On click, what will we do in this on click function? We will actually just navigate to our add node screen. Um, we don't have that yet, let's do that later. And let's set the background color of this to color.primary, I think. I think that's white. Format that a bit. And the content of that will be an icon. Icons dot uh, default dot add content description will be add node then um, is this our scaffold yes we want to set something to the scaffold state and that will be our scaffold state um, oh no I'm wrong here we actually need to put this and we will actually not need anything more here so just a very simple scaffold with a floating action button and in here we can put the content of that scaffold so of our screen in the end that will just be a big column here we have a row then here we have our order section and the lazy column of nodes so column modifier is modifier fill max size and we apply some padding of uh, 16 dp and we're going to have a row for the top section um, we will have a modifier of fill max width we will have horizontal arrangement of space between so we just push these um, this text and this to the sides left and right side vertical arrangement alignment of center vertically and then we're going to have our text in here text will be your notes and the style is material theme typography h4 and then another icon button for the order section to toggle it so icon button mm, image vector will be icons default um, sort um, just sort as content description i guess when we click this button we want to take our view model not that one and we want to call on event because that is now such an such a UI operation, such a UI action. We actually fire off from our UI to our view model, so we can just say view model on event. And which event is that? That is just our toggle order section event. And our view model will then change the state accordingly, so we see the change in our UI. Now let's next implement this order section um, below this row. And because here, as you know, we have this little animation that it slides in. We can simply use animated visibility. If it is visible, is in the end state that is order section visible. And then we can define how this animation should look like. So whenever this actually toggles, the animation will fire off again. Um, so we have an enter animation, so when it slides in. And here we can very easily just say we want to have a fade in effect. And so plus we will also have a slide in vertical effect. And for some reason it gives us an error. I don't know why. Oh, experimental annotation here. Okay, yeah, just add this annotation and then you're good to go. We can say exit is fade out. I really like how they made these animations. And slide out vertically. And that's our animation. So in here we now put the order section that we actually want to animate. And whenever this state boolean toggles, we're going to see this animation. So order section. Um, we can set the modifier to modifier fill max width. We want to set some vertical padding of let's say 16 dp. We want to set the node order, so just to make sure that the correct radio buttons are checked, to state that node order. And we want to uh, set on order change, so when we change the order, when we click on a radio button then we want to send the event to our view model so view model on event order and here we pass it so the new node order then below this animated visibility 
let's have a spacer with the height of um, 16 dp and below the spacer we will have our lazy column with a list of nodes so let's just set the modifier to fill max size and in here we just have some items let's make sure to choose this overload with a list of items so we can pass our state at nodes and get each node here and for each node we just have a node item so node is this mm, let's not do it like this let's do it like this um, the modifier will be modifier dot fill max width and we're gonna make it clickable so when we click on a node we want to navigate to the the add added node screen right now we don't have any routes for that so we are going to implement that later and when we click on on delete we just say view model on event delete node and that takes the node we're going to delete which is just this node so we can pass this and after we deleted a node we're going to show a snack bar with that undo option we can very easily do that with our scaffold state showing a snack bar needs a coroutine because that just uh, takes some time to um, show it and then it will be hidden again so asynchronous option Shepard Compose handles that with a coroutine so we can say scope that launch and here scaffold state snack bar host state show snack bar the message will be node deleted the action label will be undo and what this function will do is it will return the result so if we actually clicked on undo or if we just dismiss the snack bar so we can say val result is equal to this and then check or just say if result is equal to snack bar result action performed that means we clicked on the snack bar if that happened we want to save your model on event restore note it's really that easy and let's just add some more space um, below a node item so we have space between nodes spacer height of 16 dp and that is it for the node screen so quite some code here but now we can actually go on with the add added node screen and view model so the next step would be to create on the one and our get node use case so singular where we get a single node by its id and the um the add node use case we already have that i see so yeah let's do that right click new use case called get node use case i'll just get node gets an instance to our repository and we'll again have a suspend operator function invoke nothing new and here we pass the id of the node we actually want to retrieve so we get the node here we can import this and we just return repository get node by id and we pass the id that's already our use case we don't need to validate anything here so that we can now actually implement the the view model for that so we can go into our add net add added node package create a new package for the add added node view model hilt view model so just the default constructor here which will be called add added node view model and that will just take our node use cases so our wrapper class again and then let's see what do we need in here so let's take a look in our emulator and check what we actually need what kind of states do we need here so of course we need a state for the currently selected color here that just saves that we need a state for the current title here if we enter something we need a state for the current content and that's pretty much it for the screen and real again just have an event flow in which we send events for example when we save the node to show a snack bar or so um 
So here I will actually not wrap this into a, sting, into a single states object because we have um, text fields and then that's not so optimal because whenever we type a character here then this text field recomposes and if we put this in a single um, state class that that combines multiple states if we enter one key here in this text field it will recompose the whole UI and that's so frequently so I will have separate states here the first one for the title um, let's, let's call it node title string and empty by default and when I think about it we actually do we also want to store something else like the hint yeah we actually do want to store that so we actually also need a state because that's a custom text field we'll create here we need a state that indicates if the hint is actually visible or not so when we click it it's not visible and else it is that's behavior we need to code on our own so let's let's do that and actually create a wrapper class for that so I will call this node text field state. This will have a variable for the actual text, which is an empty string. It will have a variable for the hint, so the hint text. And it will have a variable is hint visible, which is a boolean and true initially. Because then this will be of type node text field state here. And we can create such a node text field state in here. Let's copy this. Paste it again for the... Oh, I actually don't want to change this up there. Um, come on. Um, for the node content oops not content paste it here paste it here we need a state for the currently selected color so vm state node color that's an integer state and by default it is yeah just a random color that's how i solve it you can also just pick the first one i like to use a random color um node dot node colors dot random that's a compose color and to get it as an integer we can say 2a rgb and we can remove this we're going to need our event flow again so event flow is mutable shared flow of type ui event um don't we have that already oh okay i think yeah, I actually talked about that before here in this course, but we haven't even done that yet. Um, yeah, I was quite f confused because I live streamed today and <laughs> I used these UI events there. Um, and now I'm recording this video. Okay, never mind. So, what is this event flow for? The thing is, in Jetpack Compose, if we use these normal Compose states, then these, well, they hold state. Like, for example, the selected color. So, when we rotate the screen, the, the same color should still be selected. That's what state does. But there are still some things that are more like events. So one time events actually that don't represent state. So imagine we want to show a snack bar, then we will only want to show that snack bar once. We don't want to show that again when we actually rotate the screen, so it's not really state. And that's what we need to um, use this shared flow for. Um, there is no real native Jetpack Compose solution here for these events. So we need to use the kind of the XML way of doing that. Works the same way. Um, yeah, so we can send one-time events from our view model in this shared flow and then observe in our UI from that. And depending on the event, we can do something differently. For example, just, yeah, showing a snack bar. So I will create this UI event class here. That's a sealed class, UI event. And it will have two subclasses. On the one hand, it will have a data class show snack bar, which will take the message for the snack bar of type UI event. And it will have an object save node. So when we click on that save button, uh, this one, we save the node. And after we saved it, we want to 
um, just navigate back. And that's also kind of an event. So type UI event. And one thing I actually also want to do is we want to assign a default hint here because that is by default empty. So for this uh, no title, we want to say um, enter title for the hint. And for the content, we can set the hint to enter some content. Cool. So now we have our event flow in which we can send events. We also need a public version of that, which is just event flow as shared flow. Cool. As in our other view model, we will have an on event function which will take events. This time these will be at added node events. So for this view model. So let's go to our add added node package, create a new class called add added node event. Uh, select data class and this will contain some quite some events. Basically for every single UI action the user can make we have an event here. It's it's the same as in our node screen already. So we'll have an event when we entered a title. So we basically for every single keystroke we we call this event. And this should actually be a seed class, by the way. Seed class without that and we use that instead. That looks better. Mm. So we have a value here, which is basically just the new title. Add added node event. Then we do have the same for the content. So we entered something in the content. We actually also have events when we focus our title text field and our content text field, because then we want to change our states in the end. So we want to actually hide the hints. And that is uh, that, that Boolean for that is contained in our state. So let's duplicate that and say focus title mm. well, let's call it change title focus and here we pass the focus state so if we're focusing it or not of this focus state type here from a compose ui focus we get that from a modifier later on so let's copy this paste it here do the same for the content then what else do we need? We need an event to actually change the color. Change color here. We will have the new color of type integer at added node event. And one event will be that we save the node. So when we click on our floating action button. Like that. So a little bit bigger event class here. But very helpful because now we can say add added node event here in our view model. And easily distinguish between these. So here, when we say no title dot value, um, actually, <laughs> we of course need to check if it is entered title. Then we want to say no title dot value. Just want to update that with a new title. No title dot value copy. Text is equal to event dot value. When that event is change title focus we want to say note title that value is no title value copy so when we when we actually focus our text field our title text field we want to hide our hint so we want to set is hint visible to event dot focus state is focused so when we actually not focus on the on the text field we want to show the hint. We also want to make sure that the text is actually empty because we only want to show the hint if the text is empty and we're not focused in this field. So and no title value text is blank. So that is how this essentially works. We can copy these two um, blocks here. Oh, come on. Um, because for the content it's essentially the same. So here we have entered content, note content, note content. Here we have change content focus, note content, note content, note content. 
that should be it for these four states. Next is when we um, click on one of these color circles to select a new color. So when that is change color, we want to say node color uh, color that value is node color. Uh, actually, we don't need to copy anything here. We can just say event dot color, and then here for the last event that is possible that is save node. Actually, not from UI event here from add added node event. When we click on save node on that floating action button, what do we want to do? We actually just want to fire off our add node use case. So we actually want to say view model scope the launch. So we need to launch a coroutine. And we're going to have a try and catch block because if you remember, um, we actually throw uh, invalid node exceptions, I call it, when the title or description of the node is actually empty. So here in try we can say node use cases, add node. We want to add a new node that we construct here. The title of the node is node title value text. Content is node content value text. Timestamp is system current time millis. Color is node color dot value dot uh, just dot value. And we actually also want to pass an ID here because it could potentially be that we opened an existing node and we then want to update the node when we click on save node. And remember, updating works the same way as inserting. So we have this on conflict strategy replace. That means when we insert a node here and this node already exists in the database with that given ID, it will just update it instead. And that's how it works here. So we kind of need to have a current node ID that we cache here. And if that's null, we will just insert a new node. So let's just scroll up and have that here. That can just be a private var current node ID of type integer. And initially it's null. Make it nullable here. And then you can see we can pass that here. So all we need to do is when we actually have such a node ID, so when we pass that as a navigation argument, we get that in our view model and we assign it. And else it will be null, so we pass null here. That means we'll just create a new node. Then after we call this use case, we can say event flow emit, we want to emit ui event.save node, so we can then react to that in our, in our screen and simply navigate back. And if we got an error, say if the title or content was empty, we want to say event flow emit. And here we want to say show snack bar. And the message of that snack bar will be e dot message. And if that's null, we can just say, I don't know, unknown error, or better, I think, couldn't save note. And yeah, that's it already for this on event function. How do we get the current node in the, uh, the the current node ID in here? So essentially, when we click on an existing node, then we want to then we need the ID of that node in the screen and in this view model. How do we do that? Well, we can just use a navigation argument. That's very easy. And the cool thing with navigation arguments and hild is that we can inject such a safe state handle that is kind of a bundle that also contains these navigation arguments. So we don't even need to pass that as a parameter to the view model to a function or something like that. We can just access it with, access it with this safe state handle and hilt also automatically injects this. So we don't need to do anything else other than providing this here. So in init we can say safe state handle that get, we want to get an integer, which is the current node ID. The navigation argument will be called node ID. And if that's not equal to null, 
then we can do something with that node ID. So we're gonna check if this node ID is not equal to minus one because that will be the default we use. So if we just click on this floating action button here, then we will pass minus one. So then we don't have a node. If that's not the case, we want to launch a coroutine in ViewModel scope. And then we want to say node use cases, get node, which we don't have yet. Let's go to node use cases and add that. Val get node is our get node use case, singular. Go to app module, add that here. Get node is equal to get node, passing the repository. And then we have that function here in our view model. So we can simply pass our node ID to get that node if that's not equal to null. So we can say that also. Then we get the node in here. And then we can say current node ID is equal to it.id. Let's call it node. So node.id. We want to also update the value of our title to node title copy because now uh, value copy because now we of course loaded the node and we want to take the the title of our node from our database and put it in the in the actual text field in our state so we can say text is node dot title and the hidden is not visible then and let's do the same for the content of the node node content and node content. And we want to update the color. So node color dot value is node dot color. And that's it for the view model now. So we now have everything we really need here. We expose all of our states here. Also this event flow. So next, the only thing that's missing is building the UI for the add edit node screen. And the first thing for that screen will be that we create such a yeah, kind of transparent text field here with a hint. I will do that here in our components package of the add edit node package called trans parent hint text field. Select file, make that a composable. And that will take a lot of parameters actually. Of course, it needs the text. Then it needs the hint. Then it needs a modifier. Set to the default modifier by default. Then it will take if the hint is visible or not. Let's, let's also call it is hint visible. Is true by default. Then we need something like an on value change function, which gives us the new string. So whenever we type something, this function will fire off. And then we need a text style. So we need to be able to pass a style for the text we actually display. Make sure to choose the compose text style. Set it to the default text style. Then we need a Boolean, whether that's single line or not. Mm, initially, let's set it to false. I don't know. Yeah, doesn't really matter. Mm. And the last parameter we need is actually the on focus change function. So that will give us this focus state that we already dealt with in uh, the view model and unit. So quite some parameters for this text field, but the body of this function will be very small. In the end, we will just have a box here. We can apply the modifier for that box. And here in that box, we're just going to use a basic text field, which is the, the text field that you can style the most. And let's see. Here we can basically just forward all of our parameters. The value will be text. On value change will be on value change. Modifier won't be here. Mm, we have single line is single line, text style is text style, mm, what else, hint visible, the hint that's not relevant here, 
Actually, we do need a modifier because from there we get the uh, focus state stuff. So, modifier is a modifier dot fill max width and then on focus changed. So, here we have the focus state, which is just it. And we can say on focus change with it. And that's it for the text field already. We can now display our hint on top of that. That's just a text that uses the hint. The style will also just be our text style. And let's set the color to color dark gray. And that's it for this transparent hint text field. Actually not. We need to do... Do we need is hint visible? Yeah, we do need that, because we only want to show this hint if the hint is actually visible. I think that makes sense. So far, so good. So now we can actually directly implement the whole screen in our add added note package. Add added note screen, select file, composable, add added note screen. Then in the parameters here, we need our nav controller to navigate back, to pop the backstack when we actually click save. We need the node color. Um, it will get clear why we need this here. Um, because we actually only pass the IUD as a navigation argument. It seems, I mean, it only makes sense to do that, it seems. But we actually will also pass the node color as an additional argument. I will explain why we do that when we when it makes sense to explain that. And we have our view model of type add added node view model is equal to hill view model. Cool. So in here, let's first get our references to the states from our view model. Title state is view model node title dot value. Content state is view model Note content dot value. We want to have a scaffold state in here to show snack bars. Remember scaffold state. And as I said, we will actually animate the background. So when we switch the color, there is a color fade effect here. I think that looks really cool. And for that, we use something called an animatable. So val note background animatable is equal to remember animatable. We choose the one here with the color, the initial color one, because we of course want to animate color. And the initial color for that, well, what is that? It's a color of our note color. And now you, you already see why we have this note color that we also pass. Because we need to show the initial color of the node that we actually selected. If we didn't select a node, so if we just click on um, this floating action button, we select a random color by default, which we get from the view model. But in case we actually select an existing node, then it needs to have the same color as that existing node. And that's why we actually need to pass the node color here as a navigation argument, because if we don't do that, then it, it will take a random color from our view model as the default color. So even though we pick this orange node, it could be that orange is selected, but the background is actually like blue or so. So that's why we need to pass that as a navigation argument. And here we actually want to check if the node color is not equal to minus one. So we actually did click on an existing node. Then we want to choose node color and else we want to choose the color from our view model. This one. It's, it's all about the initial color here. And to animate this, we need a coroutine scope. So we say, remember, coroutine scope again. And then just as in our notes screen, we want to have a scaffold with a floating action button, which we can create here. On click of that, what will, what will that do? It will basically just fire off an event in our view model to save a note. So view model on event, save note. Mm this one here. We want to set the background color to 
colors primary here. Mm. Let's do it like this. Yeah. And the content of that floating action button will just be an icon. Uh, not icons, just icon. Icons default save. And say save note. Cool. Then we want to assign the scaffold state here to our scaffold. So scaffold state is scaffold state. And then in the end, we're just going to have a column here, then a row of these. Oh, these will just be boxes. Um, here we have a text field, another text field, and that's pretty much it. So column. Um, the modifier will be modifier Fill max size. The background color will now be our animatable. Uh, how is it called? Note background animatable dot value. So that will just assign the current value of that animation to the background. And we want to apply some padding of 16 dp. And import that. And then let's have a row in here for our colors. Modifier is modifier dot fill max width and some padding of let's say 8 dp here let's set actually the the horizontal arrangement to space between so these are evenly spread and in here you're just going to have one of these circles for each color we have so we can say node node colors for each color let's say val color int because these are composed colors so we can say color dot two ARGB, and then we're now designing such a bubble here using a box. So you can see it's just a circle. We have a border if it's selected, and we have a shadow. Oops. Mm. So we're going to use a box. Modifier is modifier dot size. I will say fifty dp here. Um, if you want to support a lot of screen sizes you probably need to play around with that a bit or make that depending on the screen width I'll just hard code it here and for my emulator that will look fine mm. then we want to set a shadow of 15 dp and a circle shape we want to clip this to a circle shape then we want to have a border mm. actually first a background of the color so this one here. Then we can say border. The width of the border will be 3dp. The color of the border will now be if view model note color value is equal to color int. That means um, the, the color is actually selected then we want to set the border to the border color to color that black and if it's not selected we set it to color transparent and then as well just the shape set that to a circle shape so the border as well and then we can make it clickable so when we click on this um, color bubble and then we actually want to animate our color to the new color so we say scope launch Note background animatable, animate to, so that's uh, the suspend function here. And the target value will be, well, it will be our new color. So color of type color int. And we can specify an animation spec to, to define the duration of that animation, set that to tween and say duration milles to 500. So the animation will last 500 milliseconds, which I think is a good amount here for a very smooth transition. And then after that scope, we can say view model on event, and we actually want to say changed color, because when we click on that, we of course want to change the color to the color int. So far, so good. Now we have these two, uh, these, these boxes here for each color. We don't need content here for these boxes. Yeah. That's already a big part of our screen. The rest will actually be very quick because the rest only consists of text fields. 
So below, mm, below this row, here I think, mm -hmm. we want to have a spacer with height set to 16 dp. And then we use our transparent hint text field. Um, ah, I hate it. Um, what will the text be? Title state text. Let's put that on new lines. The hint will be title state hint. On value change. So whenever we type something, we will say view model on event enter title with it. So just passing the new title and on focus change is view model on event uh, change title focus with it as the focus state. Then we also want to say is hint visible is equal to title state is hint visible. We want to say single line. To, uh, we set this to true for the title. We only have one line for that. And I'll set the text style to material theme typography h5. That's it for the first text field. Let's copy this stuff here for the second one. Have another space of 16dp and just replace the stuff with content state. Here, here and here. Here we want to change it to enter content. Change content focus. Remove single line for the content. We can uh, enter as many lines as we want. The text style will be body one for the content, so not a, not a headline. And we also want to make sure that it fills the whole size. So modifier is modifier fill max height. Now one thing that's missing is actually observing our events. If you remember, we have this event shared flow in which we send events, for example, when we sh want to show a snack bar uh, right right here, or when we want to navigate away. So let's do that. Scrolling up. We can simply do that using a launched effect block, setting the key to true, so we only execute this once, not again when we actually recompose or so. And here we can just say view model, event flow, collect latest. So we just get all the events here, the latest events. And when the event is show snack bar, we can show snack bar here. And when that is save node, we can um, actually not that one, we need the UI event. Mm, save node here from the UI event. Oh, come on, like this. When we want to show snack bar, we're going to say scaffold state, snack bar host state, show snack bar, and the message will just be event.message. And when we save a node, we actually just want to call our nav controller dot navigate up. So we just go back to our node screen. Okay, that's it for our add added node screen. Now the very last thing we need to do is to actually set up the navigation, which is not that much. So in here in presentation in util, I want to define a screen class. You will know that if you watch my compose videos. That will just contain our different screens and the corresponding routes. Well, route is a string. If that is, I mean, we have different options. On the one hand, we have our notes screen of type screen and we pass a route, for example, note screen. And then we do have the same for at edit note screen. And we say add edit node screen. And then for the navigation stuff, we can go back to main activity. Let's have a surface. We don't need this. Um, the surface will have a color, material, theme, colors, background. And in here, we are going to have uh, a nav controller first. Uh, remember nav controller. And then we're going to have our nav host, in which we can define our 
single screens. So nav controller. We don't want a graph. Instead, we want a start destination, which will be um, screen dot node uh, import screen screen dot node screen dot route. And then in here we can define our different screens using such a composable function. The route will be screen node screen dot route. For this one we just have our node screen that we put in here with our nav controller. And I think we need an annotation here. Yep, let's take this one. And for the second one we will also have some arguments. So composable route is screen dot add edit node screen dot route and here we actually also want to add something to that route because we we want to be able to pass arguments and both arguments are actually optional here so the node id and node color so we are going to do this just as with uh, get parameters in a url we can say plus question mark node id let's move that in the next line node id is equal to node id and write this exactly as I do here. And then we have an and for the next parameter, which is node color, is node color. Just like this. So that way these parameters are also just optional. So we don't need to pass them. If we just click on add node, then we don't have any of these. Then we need to define these arguments using such a list here, a list of nav arguments nav argument the name will be node id for the first one and then we have such a builder in which we can actually set the type of that argument which is just an integer type and the default value for that id will be minus one let's copy that for the node color name this node color also integer, also minus one by default. Um, yeah, and then here in that block, we want to call our add added node screen, passing the nav controller. And for the node color, we can actually just pass. Um, let's do that here in a variable. Well, color is it, so our back stack entry arguments using node color as the key. Um, or let's, I think we actually need to do get integer. Get, uh, question mark, get int, node color. And if that is null, we say that's minus one. And then we assign color here. Oh man, I think that should be it. Um, one thing we actually need to do is we need to also annotate this main activity with Android entry point. So we can actually inject our view models with dagger hilt in this activity. But I think, I think, I think, I think that should be everything we need to make our app run. I will just launch it now and we'll see how it goes. So let's check our emulator here and I'll see you back when Gradle is actually finished building. Okay, Gradle is actually done. Let's see, it installs, and okay, at least nothing crashes. Can we toggle this? We can. So that works fine. Let's add a note. Click that. Oh, I remember, we forgot to add the, the navigation. Let's quickly change that. It's in our note screen. Um, yeah, I said I, I'll make that later and, and I already knew I will forget it and I did so on our floating action button when we click this We can say nav controller navigate to screen at Import screen add added node screen at route We don't pass any parameters here because we want to create a new node and when we click on a specific node here in our clickable block, in our lazy column, we want to navigate to that node, and this time we actually want to pass the, the navigation argument. So, nav controller, navigate, and we're going to navigate to screen, add added node screen, that route, 
and here we say plus question mark node id is equal to node dot id and node color is equal to node color and that should be it so let's relaunch so let's see there we go it launches if we now click plus we actually get to the screen which looks good we can change the colors the animation is working fine let's create a yellow node or greenish rather hello youtube um, this is my note content new line new line um, hopefully this works and if we click save there's our note here we actually need to change the color for that icon not too big of an issue if we click the note we get to the note it loads let's update this another color maybe click save the node is updated. We can uh, let's add another one actually to check the order. Just something with A in, in the title. Um, yeah, doesn't really matter. This color, and if we now change by title descending, then this uh, blue node should pop up at first. That's what happens. Ascending this node, ascending by date, so the the earliest node is on top. And by color, yeah, that's that doesn't really make sense here. Cool. Let's check if we can delete notes. That works. We can undo that. Works as well. And yeah, uh, this undo is really hard to read here. Um, it's it's very hard to change that. You can change it actually by providing a your own snack bar composable to the scaffold. But that is uh, yeah would be a little bit overkill here. Feel free to do that, but that. I consider that a waste of time. So yeah, if you really want to change this icon color, which of course looks better, then just go ahead and uh, go to the node icon, node item, and then here this icon button, icon, and we can say tint actually is material theme colors that on surface also, I think, that should already change it. So let's see, one final time. But yeah, that's a fully working app. Congratulations for actually following through this long. I know this is this is probably my longest video I have on my whole channel. So I would be very, very, very thankful if you could leave a comment here, if you could leave a like. Um, this is so much work to make these videos, but I hope I can actually help someone with that because this is the stuff that really gets you jobs, that really makes you a good developer. It's not all that fancy data structure and algorithm bullshit <laughs> of course it's uh, for, for getting a job that's actually also important but not for the actual practice yeah so if you want to build apps videos like these help you and of course just practicing on your own um, yeah so I would be really pleased if you could leave me a comment down below I would be really pleased if you could subscribe to my newsletter down below to receive more of, of such advice here and if you actually want to support me and actually also want to get more of this free content and especially also want to learn more advanced stuff then you also really want to check out my uh, my paid courses down below it's the first link in this video's description and yeah ju just check them out even if you don't plan on buying one just see what you would get there and yeah i can promise you you will learn a lot if you don't learn a lot then you will always get your money back if you just leave me a message within 30 days so please share like comment and if you actually like this and want more of this you can also give me suggestions for more playlist ideas that well it's not really a playlist more video ideas project ideas that i should make in future with clean architecture so i will see you back in the next video and i wish you an excellent day evening morning whenever you watch this bye bye